Hello everyone and welcome back to Bitwise where we code the complete software hardware stack for a simple computer from scratch. So today's 20, day 29, we'll be continuing on the uh, static assembler uh, pretty much where we left off from last time. Um, I guess f first I wanted to say a, a little bit about a recent uh, pacing being slower than, than before. Um, I would say especially in the last two weeks, I've been um, a little bit in a funk in terms of coding and um, haven't really been spending time away from the streams in significant quantities actually doing coding. Um, and uh, I'm trying to get back on the, uh, kind of back on the train, I guess, uh, back on the wagon, uh, starting next week, uh, this week too, but really kind of powering uh, back up uh, to old productivity levels uh, next week. But um, uh, as a result, um, <clears throat> even though I think what we've been doing on stream has been pretty good, fine, uh, you won't have seen a lot of progress sort of happening between streams, which means that, you know, basically what you see on stream is what's going on. Um, I suspect this will be, um, this will happen every once in a while as we continue with Bitwise. Um, this is just sort of a reflection of my, I guess, my productivity cycle is that sometimes I'm kind of cranking away, uh, you know, 12 plus hours a day, seven days a week, feeling good about it. And, never, and, and then I kind of lose uh, lose steam a little bit for a few weeks. And then as long as I can keep myself doing some work like I'm doing on the streams, uh, we'll get back up to, uh, to old productivity uh, soon. But um, just kind of a explanation if things have seemed to be a bit slower, but uh, uh, that's kind of the, uh, the ebb and, is it ebb and, ebb and flow of, 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 of uh, of how it is with me when my on, on these projects, but um, but anyway, uh, so let's let's jump in where we uh, where we left off last time. And uh, you recall we be, before we stopped the stream, we got basic multi-pass stuff working, uh, and I should probably realize this after last stream is that uh, I should probably move this stuff into a multi-line string since it's getting kind of awkward to see here. Uh, this is exactly what multi-line strings are designed for. Um, is that you can just have these nice, even readable kind of things. Um, like this. So it still works. Okay, so that didn't work. Let's see why that was. So where in the stream are we? I see, we're actually on the leading line. Um, yeah, I guess that's a good point. We really want, I think you want parse line to skip um, you know, to kind of optionally match. Um, keep in mind, new lines are coalesced, so uh, you can optionally match a new line. Get to the beginning. And so, as you can see, yeah, see it, see it fill in register two with the value 42 which is um, loaded from this Ford reference label. Um, so um, let's, um, let's just fill in the other instructions and the other kind of helper commands for doing this kind of stuff. Um, So that's one thing we want. Um, another command we want 
is uh, usually called org and assemblers. And uh, org just sets the, um, I guess you can't really call it an immediate. Uh, org just um, takes a constant uh, parameter and um, sets the address to that. And so this is just a way of sort of setting where you're emitting code, basically. Um, so that's one thing. And another thing that you want is an alignment command. Um, that works is you do upward alignment so you want to do um, well I guess we can this is not really performance sensitive so we can just do um, the, the slow arithmetic version which is um, let's see here add the alignment that and then divide by that and multiply by it. Um, and yeah, I guess you know something like that. So we have to fill in those entries. Org. Um, the align. Um, and I think we had something like that in the. I mean, we didn't have org because you could just set it directly, but we had the alignment command in our code here. Um, so that's kind of one set of things. Um, and let's just, I guess we can, we can test that if we want. Um, for a case like this, one thing you could test is, since we're a little endian, you could do something like this. Um, let's just, um, well, let's see here. Something like this version this one up. Add this one. I guess we do it for the alignment as well, right? that should still do the same thing um, even though we're now using these byte wise um, fillers um, and we could try doing alignment as well so we could we could say something like I mean so right now you can kind of monitor the alignment indirectly because when we do this thing here you'll see that register 2 starts out as 0 and now it gets filled in with 4 4 is the offset from the load instruction to the um, the you know the the base address of the thing we're loading, so you can see it's the very next thing. That's why it's four uh, because the instruction itself is four uh, four bytes. Um, so, for example, if we filled in some stuff like here, um, you would see it become eight because now Val is pushed a little bit. Oh no! Oh no! Because four sorry four is the upper immediate part. Um, So yeah, I guess that makes sense. So you can't directly see it there. But anyway, the fact that it gets... Um, actually, I guess that's a good one to mention. Let's do fill. 
um, there's usually a command called fill as well where you can just say like you give it sort of a, in a, a number of bytes to fill basically uh, so Um, I'm trying to remember what the usual parameters are for things like this. Let's see, gas fill command. All right, still not, work, not working apparently. Okay, I guess we'll do something like this. Um, so we'll say, Um, I guess right now in our assembler bytes, we don't really have anything, you know, to be honest, we should just probably use a loop. Um, so um, here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to have a buffer that's at most eight bytes. Um, Then I'm going to basically say uh, let's make it four because right now we, we're a 32 bit thing here. Let's just make it four. Of course, it would be nice to have <laughs> eight bytes. Oh, I guess we can actually because we don't think those those eight bytes. Um, and so uh, what we're going to do is. Uh, We're going to uh, first copy that over into that buffer. I guess we could just take the address directly now that I think about it. Um, no, let's do it like this. Um, and then we're just going to. Um, see here. We're just going to um, I think the size should be clamped at eight, right? Let's see here. Peak count value. I think parse m is already. It's returning an L long. So I guess we can just do that. Um, I guess the way we'll actually 
can you write this as that it's the max of size and size of value. That's kind of nice and simple. Um, so that's the fill command. So we could try doing something like fill. Um, yeah, I don't know. Just something like this. Um, so I'm just going to do it like that. So that means fill it with this many copies of uh, one byte, one bytes that are equal to zero, basically. Seems like probably command fill should have optional arguments, to be honest. Like um, if match token, token comma. Um, It's kind of implicit. It must just use these implicit values. Um, something like this. Because then you can do either this kind of thing here, which is basically test first. That didn't work. Uh, oh, so that's still the very first line. Oh, no, sorry, I'm looking at the wrong thing here. That's after the fill. The current token. Oh, I think I just straight up haven't built that into the table. Um, If size is greater than value, let's just do it like that. Sure. Well, I guess we also have to check it's not negative. Probably just have a
So this is more what you would hope to see, I guess. Um, now, because the offsets are so far away, we're actually using the upper immediate part of that offset. Um, and so you can see there's a big number here, but we still get 42 in the end. Um, another way you could do this without actually filling, now that I think about it, uh, Let's actually check the comments for it. I think we actually tested that. It should work. We stole that from the old Lexer. Um, the other thing you can do is you can set the address in absolute terms where zero means the beginning of the buffer. But for example, you could do something like this, which doesn't mean the same thing because this is relative to starting from the beginning of the buffer. This isn't actually filling in the buffer. This is just jumping to a certain address directly. Um, but it has some of the similar effects. So this basically just means, um, like this is something you can do if you have a variable and you want to place it at a very specific position in the image, uh, in the section rather. Uh, you can say org, whatever. I believe org stands for origin. Um, so this should work too. Nope, this does not work. That's interesting. Very interesting. Sorry, no, that's not interesting. <laughs> that's not what you do it. Yep. Because these things are processed sequentially. When you see the label at the point where um, the label is found, it grabs the value of the address. So you have to set it to a value first. Um, all right. Um, oh, someone was saying something about my 16. Oh, there we go. Thank you, Fabian. So, um, Right, so these are some, I just wanted to fill, the main thing I wanted to put in were, were just these like basic kind of data manipulators or whatever, data helpers. Um, I want to go back to filling in more of the instruction formats. Um, alrighty, um, so let's go back to doing that now. Um, I guess the first thing is that stores should be pretty similar um, in that we have a first argument, which is a register. A lot of these things, I, I don't know why I was writing match token. I really mean expect token. Match is the optional matching, but here this is really mandatory. So that was a typo. Um, so yeah, for this, let's see. No, there's not. Let's see. So if you want to do a store word, I think this is a case where the official, you know what, like, I kind of don't like this gassy stuff that they use as their official thing. So maybe this is where Fabian can sort me out. I kind of always want the destination to be on the left, even if it's something like a store. The thing that's a little bit weird about, is it really RD? So the, the thing about, well, actually, let, let me do another thing first before we do store. We should do a version of load. Um, so basically, there's two variants of load. Um, there's the kind of label-based thing where you do, you know, you load word foo. So you have, like, um, you know, you have, some, have something like this. And... Uh, and then maybe you load it later. Um, but there's also the, the sort of the low level version of load, which is uh, kind of register relative, where you do, oh, and you would say RD, some, some random register. Uh, but there's also sort of the low level version where you actually do, um, like conceptually, it's like, you know, something like this, where uh, the base address is sourced from a register and then you provide an optional immediate um, to to offset off of that and this has to be a 
uh, a 12 byte, you know, a, a small immediate in the I format. Um, so we want to support both of these with the same, like with the same, you know, instruction name. We don't want to have different instructions for that case. So Fabian's saying most risks do actually have that um, store value effective address ordering for the operands. Yeah, I mean, th that that is probably true. I don't know why I feel that way. I think it's probably just because, too, you know, too much x86 in my blood or something like that. Um, but yeah, so, uh, so, so anyway, if you look at these two different grammar rules, basically you have to make a distinction based on the leading token. Um, so if you have a register, uh, then we do one thing and, you know, and so on. So, so the way I'm going to do it is, um, let's see here. Um, if we have a, a register. Um, let me think about how I want to structure this. Well, I could, I could, I could do it like this. Um, so if we have an X register, then, um, well, let's see here. Um, if we have an X register, then I guess we do something like this. See. So if we have an X register, then we source it from that. And then uh, optionally, I think you want to have an optional offset. Um, so if, if you can match a different, uh, no, not a comma, I guess it would be L paren. Um, then you get a immediate offset, it's called M. And uh, then in this case, it's actually just a direct, uh, oops, so a direct LW, RD equals RD, RS1 equals RS1, M equals M. Um, the thing we have to do is we have to add some of these guys. I guess I didn't balance things correctly. Um, all right.
Um, So we should be able to uh, do this thing kind of in a different way, I suppose, by, well, let's make it just, let's make it just a smaller immediate. Um, then what I'll do is I will I will put in this value into the register um, and then I will do x2 x1 I think that should immediate here. Oh, I guess it is out of reach. MD. Um, yeah. Oh, wait, that's actually from a different case, isn't it? Oh, right. It's actually this one, isn't it? Not, not the. Okay, so yeah. So that works. Um, you should also be able to do this. And I guess if you did something like this, you should be able to also do that. Um, so yeah, so I think that's the syntax you want for that. Let's see what people are talking about with their preferences for author and order for stores. I'm curious about the uh, like the so so I I buy apparently that and, and and this is a case where I just haven't done enough of it to really know the legacy of um, of, of of why the instruction set chose to put the thing on uh, you know not putting the destination on the left but would, do you know what the actual argument is there uh, Fabian or anyone else it's not a big deal obviously but kind of curious. Uh, this is also making me realize that I should do a, um, whatchamacallit, I should do a helper for doing these things like, uh, all right, um, li. Uh, load immediate um, parse and immediate and I think I guess we we need two cases um, if uh, if m let's see here I call those constants. Uh, I immediate min. Okay. I immediate. Min. So we want to check 
if this thing can fit in a single instruction. And if so, um, we just do that. Now let's just put an error. And so we should be able to do this. shouldn't be done right away because it needs to be signed. Um, so what am I doing wrong? 256. If this is in the range between the min and the max, do that. Otherwise complain. Yeah, so that's that works so it knows how to load that um, but we can also handle this case using um, what is it lui rd equals rd first doing this Add i rs1 is rd. So we first fill in the upper half with this fix up. Then we do the add i, adding onto it the lower part. So this case still works, but now we should be able to have a big intermediate. work. You know what? I'm going to be a rebel and put the stores, the destination on the on the left, because we're deviating from gas anyway. And I mean, I guess this is maybe a more substantial deviation, but uh, let's be rebellious. Um, so let's first handle the non-label variant, which is sort of similar to this. Um, and so the first thing we do is we parse a sim. And if it's a register, um, if it's a register, it 
this is always fun, right? We should almost certainly factor this out, but um, I mean specifically this little thing. But um, no, let's copy and paste it with wild abandon. Um, so parse this thing and then parse one. Well, actually, let me remember what what we actually do in the dynamic assembler. So the temp register, right, that's where the address, so source, so RS2, RS2 is where the value comes from, right. So does that make sense? First operand symbol, if it's a X register, um, then that becomes RS1, then there's optional immediate in parentheses as an offset, and then we need a uh, comma, and then we need RS2, which contains the actual value to store into memory, Oh, and this is also not right. Um, actually, all of these are wrong, I guess, in that sense. Uh, this should be, what is that field called? Op. This should be instr def op. This should be instr def op. And right. Let's make sure this stuff still works. And um, let's see here. So I guess I mean we can do something simple like um, I don't know. So we load it, uh, and then maybe we can double it, and we can store it. Um, we can store it back out and um, load it into another register. All right. And maybe in this, yeah, so maybe to be fancy, we can then load it from the label in the second instance just to make sure these two things are consistent. Okay, didn't like that. Expected integer dot x bar. Okay. Um, so we have 42. And now we double it. And now we should be storing it back out. And now we should be storing in that in x3. So that looks correct. Um, you know, I'm so used to x86 stuff that I really like these kind of dereference brackets for anything that den denotes an address. But um, maybe that's uh, a little bit too, too much inserting my personal uh, idiosyncrasies into the syntax. But I actually kind of like stuff like this. Uh, but anyways. All right.
right. Um, let's do stores with you know, basically the same kind of stuff here. Oh, sure. Yeah, so. Should I do brackets? I kind of like brackets, to be honest. Um, and you're right, like, in that case, we should probably just do it like this. Yeah, you know what, I kind of like this. So let's see here. Um, I guess really we were talking about code being kind of redundant. I think what you want is you want to have a parse thing that basically parses that kind of like, I don't know, an, an address or something like that. I don't know what the best name for it is. Um, it's called adder. Um, and so you can say like if match to uh, All right, um, some data X reg, and I guess in this case, if we follow that uh, bracket syntax, we have optional thing there.
kind of overload this. Um, yeah, let's call it Val. So let's see, uh, open bracket and then a symbol. And if the symbol is a register, then grab that register index and optionally look for a comma separated immediate and fill that in. And that. Otherwise, check that it's a label. If it hasn't been referenced before, then fill in a dummy value. And then say this is a label and the value is blah, blah, blah. And obviously, this is going to expect it unknown. All right, I guess we need. So, so far we only made the substitution, I think, for LW, so we should be able to do this. Um, and this. That works, and then we should be able to switch some store handling to that as well. Um, I guess then we can also say expect token comma uh, RS2 and uh, then here RS1 should be the reg, this should be RS2 and this should be val. Sec. Make sure my code still works. It's not because now we have to 
change it to use this bracket notation. Um, this should be <laughs> oh god is the buzzing still there yeah i have no idea because i could have sworn i fixed it for like several weeks and now every once in a while it comes back i'm sorry about that i should really try to fully root cause that issue but because uh, i thought i had fixed it all right um let's also test i guess just this notation here like if we um, we do this. Yeah. Again, it's hard for me to, it, like, I like this bracket stuff so much more. It's really hard for me to figure out how much of that is habit. I'm sorry, it's 99% habit. But I think especially with stuff like the operand ordering here, especially if you're going to have the optional uh, immediate, it it's too symmetric otherwise. I like how it breaks the symmetry, uh, to be honest. Uh, so yeah, this is good. Um, All right, so let's do this one as well. Um, so if we have a label, calculate the offset, and now we have to make sure the operands are correct. So I believe, again, RS1 is the adder reg, RS2, this is RS2, and yeah. RD. Oh no, there's a temp register. That's one thing that's different about this case. So um, if there's a label, there's an additional operand, which is a temp register. Uh, Unfortunately, this is not something you can really abstract away unless you want to have a magic register allocating assembler or some kind of ABI convention where there's a reserved register. So um, we need another register. And I guess in this case, This should really be RT, right? So RT, which is the temp register, we'd load with the high part of the immediate, and then uh, that becomes the register part of the address operand to which we add the lower part of the immediate, and we source, oh yeah, so this should then be RS2. RS1, yeah, that's right. Now I should complain about, oh no, I guess because we're not using it yet. Um, but we should be able to do this as well. But it should complain about an error because we don't have a temp register. Yeah. Um, so X3 is going to be a temp register. So uh, yeah, on the note of the um, of the temporary register operand, Fabian is saying MIPS has the at register assembler temporary. Okay, so is that is that something you can set sort of as a variable basically in in a section of your assembler code or as a global or whatever? 
that uh, it's sort of an implicit operand if you don't provide it explicitly or something. That does seem like a better way to do it rather than having to specify it for every single uh, store instruction that, that uses um, a label. Uh, for now, I'll make it an explicit operand, but that sounds like a good quality of life thing to add uh, to have that kind of designated temporary register that, that's just uh, implicitly provided when uh, or used for, for anything like that. Or is, or is the at uh, register, the AT register, is it actually an ABI thing? Or, I mean, because you could probably, well, I'm, I'm assuming it's a, an assembler feature rather than an ABI thing. Because I, I assume if you want to use it you, ubiquitously, you need to be able to change it at well rather than have it be hard coded. All right. Um, so loads and stores. <clears throat> All right, so these are a few major classes. Let's do control flow. Um, let's do branches first. Let us do branches. So for branches, you have these are compare. These are fused compare and branch instructions. So we have um, we have two register operands. Actually, that's not true. There are also branch immediates. So I need to actually distinguish those in my table. Um, oh no, I was wrong about that. Is that really no? Maybe these are pseudo instructions. I'm getting myself confused. Yeah, I'm just getting myself confused. Um, so yeah, there's no branch in. That is baloney. Um, so yeah, two register operands and a uh, and a label. Um, I probably should have a parse label kind of deal here, which is basically this. Um, I guess you really want, well, let's only support labels to start with. That seems reasonable. Let's only support labels to start with. Um, So we have an address, um, and we want to calculate an offset. Um, I guess you really want to make this be signed. Um, I guess it's be immediate actually.
All right. Um, so to get ourselves started, let's say we have, let's do some kind of dumb loop. We actually have an example we can just hijack from back here. Yeah, okay. So, uh, let's see, we have a done label, and uh, what you say is if x1 is 0, then go to done. Otherwise, um, let's say x2 is our accumulator. Otherwise, add x1 to x2. I guess we need our unconditional jump in order to go back as well. So um, let's actually put that in while we're at it. So JAL is jump and link. Um, and so I think the first thing is always a destination register where to add the next instruction. Uh, or the, the next inst sequential instruction address if there is, you know, if, if not for the control transfer. Um, and then I guess the second one is just really, you know, the, the target. And, um, JL, from what I remember, let's see, how did we implement that? Right, so it's just an unconditional control transfer, and it's not, oh, it is relative, right, right, right. It is relative. Um, I think that's it, right? So there's RD and there's branch BC, and branch BC comes from the immediate, so that looks right. Um, and I think while we're here, we might as well fill in a pseudo instruction. I don't know. <laughs> this is me again being too much of an x86 person, but I think J is like way too short. Like this is the official, <laughs> this is the official mnemonic for a basically a jump and link with, uh, you know, the link being thrown away, um, sending it to. Yeah, what I call jump. I'm sorry. I really hate that. I mean, I should add a add a synonym, but I really hate the fact that it's called J. That's personal bias. Um, yeah, that's called J. I'm okay with it. I'm going to call the function jump. Um, all right, and um, what you want to do 
is So we set uh, x0 as the thing here. This should be assigned so we can do these comparisons correctly. Unresolved name command jump. Oh. Oops, no. Um, boom, boom, boom. And so we should be able to say, well, let's first do it with the uh, with the manual variant, just to make sure that works. Probably we should probably decrement the uh, the loop counter. Oh shit, we don't have support for negative numerals right now because we don't have a constant evaluator. So Previously, I wasn't handling this. I'm going to, ma excuse me, we're probably going to handle this negation as just a constant expression thing later, but for now, let's just uh, do it the, uh, do it directly in the scanner. And I'm not gonna be worried about, um, overflow because this is just a temp measure line seven expected integer dot comma integer dot line six seven Oh, well, there's definitely something wrong with the error reporting. Okay, so that's working. Uh, let's make the loop shorter. So that's six, that's 
3 plus 2 plus 1, that, that is 6, and now that should start getting overridden by the old code and that other. Incidentally, I'm sure Fabian is having a seizure over the way I wrote this, but like the, the way you're normally supposed to write this code, if, if you're a good assembly programmer or a good compiler code generator, is um, something like this. Let's see. Oh, actually, before I make that change, let's make sure that uh, that this works. Oh, interesting. So, oh, it's probably a bug in the parser. Um, can we jump? Minus 12, clearly not out of range. Oh, it's because it should be the offset. All right, so this still works. Um, but yeah, I feel obligated to mention that um, you're, if, if you're good, you're supposed to write something like this. Unconditional. Uh, let's see here. If um, if not equal, uh, if not equal, go to loop. Otherwise, fall through. So this way, you don't have this redundant conditional. Oops, you don't have this redundant unconditional transfer except the first time. I'm sure you guys have seen this if you've looked at assembly code or have written anything. Is that uh, you do one? You so said this way you only have one unconditional control transfer at the beginning, and the check is actually at the end of the loop body. And so at the end of the loop body, you recheck the condition. You have to change the sense of it because now you're not checking whether to skip, but you're ch checking whether to repeat. So if we're non zero, then we try again. But you know statically that the first check will, I mean, sure, but this is a test, right? Normally these things would not, uh, yeah, normally these things would be loaded dynamically. Like for example, um,
this is a little bit of a dirty way of doing it. Normally you would use assembler constants, but um, because of the way org works, it doesn't actually enlarge the buffer. It just sets the address pointer. So this is just a, a simple way of getting labels to point to things. Um, but I think normally people would use assembler constants like EQU or whatever you call them in your assembler of choice. But yeah, let's try, um, the reason I'm doing this is let's try, um, let's try loading. Let's do doing a get char. And um, then based on the value, we will, let's see here. Um, we have to subtract this thing. Maybe I will do it like that. Like that. I mean, I could do sub i, or not sub i. That value yeah, minus, minus 48. Um, so load that, subtract 48. All right. Um, let's say three. Lo and behold, the register now has value three. Um, let's say value nine. So yeah, you do stuff like that. But yeah, normally you wouldn't really abuse org the way we're using it uh, for this memory mapped IO labeling. So please don't think that's a good habit. But uh, given that we don't have a, uh, we don't have constants right now. Uh, like define constants, name constants. This is probably the easiest way to do it. Um, all right, let's see. Let's see what else is missing. Um, I think we have the big stuff now. We don't have CSRs, but we don't have any interesting CSRs in the emulator, so I don't really want to do that until we have something there to exercise. I should use J. I should I should do JLR. JLR is just the version of this where rather than a uh, offset, you get a uh, a register. So rather than a relative offset from that, you um, have a register operand. I think that's all it is, right? Yeah. Let's look at the emulator. It's the easiest way to check. Right, so we're still in RD. Oh, and, and there is a immediate. I forgot about that. There is an immediate offset.
I guess you would want to use this kind of notation. Okay, so this actually uses I immediates. Um, So jail, oh yeah, it's for doing indirect jumps, but they also have that kind of linking effect where you can store a return address into a register of your choosing. So um, one thing you can do, of course, is well, um, maybe we should fill in some call and return. I'm trying to remember. So JLR, aside from, you can use it for different things. You can use it just for normal indirect jumps through a register, but you can also use it for things that are sort of, yeah, like this, it's just jump register. So we should do like, let, let's do these things. Um, yeah, let's do these helpers. So that's one thing. When you get into call and jump, you co or call and return, you kind of need um, you need a you need a what you call it an ABI of some sort about where to put. Like when I when I do a call on a function, there needs to be an agreement between caller and callee what register contains the return address. So you can see in this case it's x1, right? No way. Let's 
So you're jumping. Oh, I see. Okay, okay. Yeah, X1. Sorry, I was reading. It looks like this is misaligned. Do you see what I mean? Like, it's not clear to me that the AUIPC was actually part of this uh, entry. Um, but yeah, so AUIPC in the normal way for long offsets. So X1 is the link register part of this API. Um, and then... I mean, yeah, we can totally, we can totally, I, I, we're coming up at the end of the stream. I'll go 30 more minutes. Um, so let's put in, uh, let's put that in. Um, yeah, I guess we, we parse an adder, um, and depending on whether it's register based. Let's say it has. Let's say for the call pseudo instruction, it has to be a label. That seems reasonable. Um, and so, um, you want to say this system signed. Well, I guess it doesn't really matter in this context, actually. Uh, this minus the current address. And um, then we do AUIPC and X6 is the so temp register. I guess because it's a call or save register. Um, I think I'm going to saw the typo. Line 985. Oh, yeah. Thank you, sir. Um, for the return, yeah, there's no operands. So really, all we're doing is we. Right. The return address at this point should be an X1. The link register. So we just have to throw that. We, we we don't want to save our our sort of origin address or whatever. So we just want to uh, jump through this with the zero immediate, something like this. So uh, let's test this with our friend Mr. Factorial. Um, So let's say the argument is x2, and so um, let's see, if x2 is equal to x0, then so let's say That. Um, uh, 
and let's say the return value is also x2. So we can just leave it there. Um, since this is right, so if x2 is the argument, if it's 0, if it's not 0, then we do go and do some work. Otherwise, well, I guess the problem with doing recursive stuff is we need stacks. I don't want to deal with call stacks right now. Let's just test a basic subroutine use case. Like, um, since we don't have a multiplication uh, instruction in this subset, in the basic RV32i subset, let's actually do a multiplication instructions. Um, And so what we're going to do is we're going to say um, actually let's say result in x4. Um, so x4 starts out as zero, and we do the multiplication check, and the multiple and the check here is if x2 is non-zero, then we loop. Otherwise, we return. Uh, and then this is the body. Um, and what we do is we add to x4 a copy of x3. And then we count down x2 by 1. So we'll first make sure that assembles successfully. Expected name got new line. So it says line start is that. Yeah, okay, that's a Lexer bug with comments. Um, all right, let's check if this works. So at the end of all this stuff, um, and I guess let's put it at the beginning. Um, at the, so actually, and let's use this. Let's say uh, we want to multiply two numbers. Single digits here, and um, and then we call mall. That's not really. I think for the call instruction, we were actually calling parse adder, right? Which doesn't seem like the right thing here. Okay, so press enter. 
um, executing the first instruction. And um, let's say we multi want to multiply 3 by 4. So there should now be a control transfer to, yep, 96. And let's look at the code to see if we can follow along what it's doing. It should load x4 with 0, which we wouldn't be able to tell. And um, it should jump, yeah. So it just loaded this, and now it should jump some, yeah, jumps three instructions ahead. Does this check and should jump back, and then should end up adding, yeah, four, eight, twelve, and now it should jump back to where it started. Which is here. And we now have 12 there. So that seems to work. All right, let's see. This is uh, turning out to be a pretty nice amount of stuff we're able to do today because all the groundwork was already uh, completed in previous streams. Um, so let's see what else we want to tie up before we finish the stream. Um, we have loads and stores and branches, JL, JLR. We don't have these. Eh. Don't know how useful these are. I mean, we should support them, but um, these are kind of low-level instructions. Most of the time, you want to just use li or maybe, yeah, I guess AUI PC. We can add them in, but I want to see if there's something bigger and more substantial. Okay, we have these. We have these. We don't have defense instructions. We don't have these. We don't have anything interesting to do with the uh, environment call and break. These are for system calls and for software breakpoints. Uh, and these won't do anything because we don't have a <laughs> we don't have a memory model to worry about. Uh, we don't have any interesting CSRs either. So I think this is um, may maybe I'll do these actually. Uh, maybe I'll do these just to finish off. We'll call it a day. Yeah, infinite loop because it was out of range. Um, all right. I think that's it for today. And I think the code is also finally in a shape where I can check it in and it will actually be interesting potentially to look at. So I'll also make sure to check this in, even though I hadn't previously checked in versions of this because I thought it wasn't really, there wasn't enough there to be val valuable. Um, but I think this is okay to look at. Um, and so I plan to check this in today. Uh, let's see if there's anything else I missed. If people have any questions, I can answer them before we finish the stream.
All right. So yeah, um, this is already, you can do a bunch of real assembly programming with what we have if you want to. Um, the stuff that's going to be annoying is we, first off, we don't have constant, you want to have a constant expression evaluator um, and named constants. So that's probably something we're gonna add next. And we've done that already in the compiler so we can follow what we've done there. It's more or less going to be the same sort of deal for constant expressions. Um, the other thing we want, and, and as part of doing the constant expressions, we'll also have various constant expression helper functions. Like in gas, they have like, what is it? M high, like they have these kind of things that we're currently using as helper functions in the assembler. They have them exposed as constant functions. So you can call them in constant expressions. So we can add stuff like that as well. Um, the other thing you'll probably want, um, Maybe, like, I'm trying to think of what I need for writing my fourth implementation that I would hate not having. I think definitely one thing I want is local labels. Um, you can see it's already annoying here it, when we're writing this multiplication uh, uh, subroutine. It's annoying that you have to do this kind of namespacing for these basic names. Um, different assemblers have different sort of tricks for dealing with label shorthands and locally scoped labels and stuff like that but whatever we end up doing exactly I have something in mind uh, but whatever we end up doing you'll want some solution to that otherwise um, managing label names is, is a mess and they don't contain much value like really uh, I quite like there's a different few there's a few different variants of this idea but one that's that I quite like um, well Let's do it like this. First off, if you want to have this column alignment, uh, one thing that works quite well for this is, um, I mean, this is like the gas style labels where you have these uh, first off numbered labels, and then what you can do is you can do 2f, and here you can. I'm going to undo it because my code, obviously the assembler doesn't support it right now. And then for this, you would do 1B, something like that. And the idea here behind this notation is um, numerical labels have this kind of special meaning. And uh, one thing you can do with them is you can have multiple definitions of them and then refer to them in a sort of local way where 2F means actually, yeah, it is 2F. 2F means the label 2 in the forward direction. So Searching forward from from the from this instruction's location, you you find the first label named two. That's what F stands for. Here you say the first label named one in the backward direction. So starting from here, going backwards. Um, so this is a nice way of having these kind of topological. It's almost like a topological notation that's less about um, the meaning of the names and more about their locations. And so you don't have to make up dummy names. Um, and so maybe we'll do something like this. Um, there's other variants of this, like um, one that I quite like that I first came across in a 6502 assembler looks like this. Um, you just have these bullets and then you do like this. Um, and what this notation means uh, is this means plus plus. It means go to the the anonymous label to, twice forward. So plus would be the the first bullet. Plus plus means the second bullet from this location. Minus minus means you know the, the opposite. So the first bullet would be on the same line, and then another minus would be here. So that's another notation uh, which uh, serves the same basic purpose, but has some slightly different notational choices. But regardless of what you do, I think this kind of topological notation that doesn't force you to choose names is almost a prerequisite for writing substantial programs. Otherwise, it gets really messy and uh, annoying. So something like that we'll want to add as well. All right, um, I think that's it for today. Uh, I'm pretty happy with where we ended up with, despite what I felt was a lack of meaningful progress in previous streams. But I think this is. Uh, uh, 
this is already beyond what we had with the dynamic assembler. And I, like I said, I think with with some basic constant expression support and some support for local labels of some sort, I think this is ready to be uh, used for writing, uh, starting work on the fourth implementation I want to do with it. All right. Um, and actually, let me just undo. <laughs> let me just undo these local label things, and make sure I didn't break the code. All right. Anyway, thanks for hanging out. Um, the um, like I said, I hope the pace will start picking back up uh, starting next week. Uh, but um, you know, I guess if you're just watching the streams, it doesn't. You don't, maybe don't really care because you see what's going on in the stream if you care about the absolute pace in terms of what's getting done off stream maybe you care but uh but in any case uh, the pace will pick up uh, probably starting next week and maybe even the rest of this week um so thanks for hanging in there uh we'll we'll get you know as long as we're making consistent progress uh, we'll get there eventually uh so so hang tight and thanks for uh thanks for watching i'll see everyone on friday <laughs>